Thanks, Richard. This is Shane Ray, and he and I are actually office suites over at the bar shop, but I'm sure he doesn't see me very much because I'm over here most of the time. Um, but Shane is a, um, a scientist who studies C. elegans and looks at um, C. elegans as an aging model and, and relevant to human aging. And so he's going to share with us some work that he's done today. And we're really happy to have you. Thank okay. you for coming. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for the invitation. Also, um, thanks for turning up. So I have to admit, when I when I put my talk together, I wasn't sure if Al was going to be here, and I just figured that no one would know too much about Sierra. So I did throw some slides at the beginning there on, on worms. But uh, so so our lab, of course, uh, is an aging lab, and, and I think most like most people, we're going to figure out why it is that we age, and of course, my my selfish reason for having my lab is why I age, right? But, um, so I think, but to address uh, what, why, why things age, I think we need to answer a couple quick questions from at the very beginning. First, what is aging? And this is my favorite definition of aging. This is the idea of um, homeostenosis, where, where basically whatever state a system exists in, its ability to maintain that um, state, or at least within some state that's compatible with life, decreases with time. And so that's, why, that's why stenosis, the narrowing of this time, of this homeostatic window. Does it happen in the machine systems? Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess so. Um, if you're looking at stress, metal fatigue stress and stuff like that. I mean, yeah, in a system. In a system? What do you mean? Yeah. Uh, computer crashes over time in a system, or plain electronics, or... Uh, factory. <laughs> I mean, because you're you're making a statement about systems, so that it would necessarily be biological systems. Right. Okay. Um, uh, I guess what I guess what I'm referring to here then is is a, a system that's in um, a pseudo steady state equilibrium. Okay. So it's just static, but hold, holding concentrations um, at a pseudo at a pseudo Steady, steady concentration. Okay. So, in, and in that sense, what we aging then becomes a question of uh, what level are we going to be looking at here? So you can imagine uh, we, we we certainly know from studies on single cells that even single cells age. But does the system break down at the level of the tissue of the organ, uh, or is it just a plumbing? In the extreme case, you can imagine having a a perfect uh, set of organs, and yet it's just the blood system the ability to transfer things between organs. So the first question that we need to address is what level are we going to address aging at? So for me, uh, I'm interested in cellular aging and, and that's very tractable with a model organism such as C. elegans. It's also important to point out the difference between public mechanisms of aging versus private. So those mechanisms that are shared between species versus those that are peculiar, uh, for example, to C. elegans. Uh, again, uh, my lab works on mitochondria, which is a fairly public mechanism on the last slide check. But then finally, what we want, uh, need to also be aware of is that aging just isn't genetic and it just isn't environmental, but there, uh, uh, there's a random component to it. And that's illustrated very nicely, uh, again, by considering the elegans, which are genetically uh, identical individuals. And we culture them for the, for the best of our ability in an environment that's uh, identical or, or, or in a flask and an incubator. And yet we still come out with individuals that have um, upwards of 30 days differences in their lifespan. So there has to be random there has to be random effects. And, and what might that random effect be? You can imagine when we're setting up an embryo, um, if we have 10 transcription factors, uh, 10 copies of one transcription factor, when you're working at that level, it becomes statistically impossible for all those transcription factors to be in one corner of the universe. And so you can imagine an organism set up very differently. So having, having said that, um, let me tell you what I'm going to tell you about. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the C. elegans mite units and how mitochondrial dysfunction can actually lead to an increase in lifespan. I'm going to tell you about our, um, basically our metabolomic studies and how this has now led us into this idea of this Cupid inhibition story. And uh, I'm not one for translational, uh, the translational science bandwagon. I think science has always been translational. Um, and I'll be happy when the fad passes. But I do think that there may actually be some trans translational relevance. 
Okay, so C. elegans, for those who aren't familiar with the model. 25% um, of the genes have orthologs in humans. Um, when you're working on aging, of course, the gold standard for aging is, is uh, lifespan analysis. And of course, to do that, you'd like to have an organism which has a short lifespan. So these guys have a lifespan that averages two to three weeks. And uh, that's temperature dependent. Over here, I have a uh, illustration of the life cycle of C. elegans, for those who aren't familiar. Basically, they go through four larval stages in the course of three days, hatch into an adult, oh, sorry, molt into an adult. There's an alternate L3 stage for the Dow. And this Dow stage is a non-feeding, stress-resistant stage that can live up to nine, uh, nine months. Typically, three months, but they can stretch out to nine months. So the heritability measures on lifespan indicate, depending on which mechanism you're using to, to determine heritability, somewhere between 20 and 50%. Uh, we, as I said before, they're self-fertilizing macrodites, meaning that every loci or thereabouts is homozygous. And uh, there's males in the population that come up with a, a rare frequency of about 1 or 500, but enough to actually make them. You can actually encourage their development and their production. And that's great because you can move genes between strains. So it's a very, very facile organism. And then finally, uh, two other uh, properties that uh, are bad. Uh, great, uh, of course, the genome sequence, but great tools. Um, in the last word meeting, we, uh, methodologists come out to actually now make targeted uh, mutations in worms and actually introduced, and introduced uh, tags into the, into the genetic life cycle. So this is, this is a big deal. This last thing here is kind of like, this, this was the boom for the last maybe 10, 15 years, uh, this feeding RNA. Right? So one of the nice things about worms is that you culture them on bacteria. And so you can, make, you can force a bacteria to make double-stranded RNA. Worms can eat, that bacteria, eat those bacteria, take up the double-stranded RNA, and uh, process, process that into SI RNA and actually knock down the favorite gene of interest in the world. So it's a very powerful tool. And so that's been, that's been the basis of many different screens uh, over the last several years. Okay, so very quickly, I'm not going to go through this because I, I want to watch the time. All I want to say here is that there are multiple pathways that are, that are known to affect lifespan. They, they funnel down to a small number. In the worm, there are well over 200 genes that are known to affect lifespan. And of course, that's 1% of the genome. And you can't have every, every gene can't have its own pathway. And of course, they funnel down. I'm going to be specifically talking about these mitochondrial electron transport chain dysfunction mutants. Okay. Uh, again, just basic biochemistry. Uh, we got a picture here of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Points to note here uh, that the uh, electron transport chain is comprised of uh, four multi subunit proteins in an ATP synthase down here. And uh, the, the, the basic deal here is that succinate and NADH, the electrons off these two compounds are sent down all the way down to oxygen. Mm -hmm. So essentially we've got a little battery here. And by in extracting those electrons, it creates a chemiosmotic gradient on the pumps on 1, 3, and 4. And that, those protons are then used to drive the ATP synthase. And that ATP synthase would normally operate in the reverse direction. So it's only, that, it's only that potential that's keeping it pushing in, into the ATP synthase direction. So I put this up because the mite mutants in C. elegans uh, all affect this process. All of them affect some element of the electron transport chain. So here, here's what we know about the mite mutants. They're all long lived. As I said, they all disrupt the chain. Most of them have been defined by RNAi, although there are some genetic mutations. Um, they extend lifespan on the order of two, uh, 20 to 200 percent. And this classic mite phenotype is characterized by a constellation of phenotypes. Slow development, small size, reduced fertility, uh, uh, slow movement, and of course their long life. Okay, so there's no rhyme or reason as to which complex is a hit in the chain. The only one that's missing up here is complex 2, and I think that's more because there's only four subunits in that complex. Uh, although we haven't published it, we know that we can knock down one of the subunits of complex two and get lifespan extension as well. So I don't think there's anything peculiar there going on. One other point I want to make out, uh, point out is that, or at least note, is that not all electron transport chain mutants are long life. In fact, there are some that are short life. So we have this very interesting phenomenon here. 
Some, some disruptions of the chain with the lifespan expansion, others leave the life short. Here's an illustration of the kind of lifespan extension that we can expect to find in the worms. This is a complex one mutation, UI2, as a, as a doubling of lifespan. Um, and here's a bunch of other ones. Uh, complex 3, this is for taxin, the gene that's disrupted in Friedrich's taxin. In worms, leads to lifespan increase. Clock 1, ubiquinone biosynthesis. Uh, complex 4, and ATP synthase complex 5. Okay, so, so I think the uh, most obvious thing to, uh, to everyone here has got to be uh, uh, what's up with worms, given that we know that when we disrupt the electron transport chain in humans, that uh, quite often results in uh, uh, disease. And, and over here I'm just illustrating certainly that several of these genes, the same, very same genes when disrupted in humans lead to life short. So the real question is, can we learn anything from the worms? Are they pulling a trick that we might be able to use? to apply to humans, or is it just a worm-specific thing? And uh, here's, a, here's a, a list of um, several mutations and, and disruptions associated with diseases in humans. Um, things that I want to point out, uh, we have the primary mitochondrial DNA mutations versus the nuclear DNA mutations, versus those that indirectly affect mitochondria. And, uh, and again, I guess many people will know that many mitochondrial diseases are, called, uh, are what's called threshold effect diseases. And, and that means that a phenotype might have a disease-associated a, a disease mutation, but it might not present a phenotype. It's known that behind that, at least in part, for the mitochondrial DNA, is heter uh, uh, heteroplasmy, the idea that not all DNA, uh, not all copies of the mitochondrial DNA contain the mutant allele. Okay, like every mitochondrial container on DNA. There's also the concept that you even see this for nuclear DNA mutation. So there has to be some other compensation going on, right? There has to be something compensating. Either that or, or uh, these all mark genes that are rate limiting for, some, for a flux through the chain. Okay, so here, here, here's one of the solutions why worms are different from humans. Dilution is the solution. That means that the mite phenotype is a, great, is a greater phenotype. So, in actual fact, worms aren't really that different from humans after all. And that's kind of illustrated here. What we've got is what, what we, we've uh, termed a RNA dilution series. Well, we've just taken a feeding RNA eye construct. I was telling you about how you can feed double-stranded RNA from worms. This is, a, this is against ATP3. And we're knocking down, um, uh, progressively knocking down from vector alone and increasingly knocking it down. So we're just diluting the bacteria with bacteria that contain vector, empty vector. Mm -hmm. And what we see here, this is lifespan in red. What we see here is that it's not until we get to about one in a hundred dilution that lifespan actually starts to increase. And this is the this is measuring mRNA level. We didn't have a we didn't have a protein uh, antibody against this uh, protein. But you can see that there's a sweet spot for lifespan. And you can see once you pass that threshold, in actual fact you short lifespan. Obviously, very similar to what you, what you see, uh, what you would expect to see in human. Sarah, are you right? Oh, and oh we were saying, what, yeah, what, what, what's the function of this ATP? ATP3 is, is, yeah. is uh, uh, one of the subunits uh, that sits in the, in the ATP synthase. In fact, this particular subunit connects the, uh, the F0 and the F1 subunits of the ATP synthase. Okay. okay. This is the, I think, I believe this is the uh, oligomycin sensitivity conferral protein, OSCP. Okay. Okay. I can say that Shane, because the only the last two dilutions would be lower than the vector. Yeah. So I mean it's almost pure stuff there, but your your mRNA here, every single data point is lower than the yeah. vector. So So this is that threshold effect again. If I, I mean, mean is it a really a threshold effect or just if the last two data points where it's well, I, so much of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, what I suspect is yeah. <laughs> what I suspect might be going on. Yeah, is that I don't know what this translates to into protein, amount of protein. But but if it's if there's a direct correlation between the mRNA and the protein, then you, you would argue that it's not until you get down to forty percent protein that you actually start. You, that's your threshold. That's you you can get by with um, forty percent of your protein, and all of a sudden anything below that you just can't function. And, and uh, it's known, for example, with a complex four mutation, you can get down to 10%. So, so clearly it's not the right limiting factor to change. 
another another site in the chains of identity theft. And I think that's what this really reflects. Um, this is showing the effect on animal size, by the way. Uh, as soon as we kick in, it's one in a hundred. This is at, this is final adult size, and you can see that uh, these animals get progressively smaller. In fact, this guy here is an L3 arrest. He's a larval arrest, but these guys here are all adults. And here's a picture of those guys here. This is where the lifespan extension is happening. And uh, these guys are, are going beyond the ability to actually show lifespan extension. So whatever's going on, there's some kind of detriment. Right, so, so what is responsible for the might be longevity? And that's what I really want to talk about here, here today. Okay? So the usual suspects, right? I mean, all of these I'm going to tell you about now. I'm just going to skim over. You know, Everyone's, uh, including us, have, have looked at these and found that, yeah, these things are involved. So the first thing I want to, this, the first disclaimer here is that there are a bunch of things going on in these animals. And I don't think there's necessarily just one thing that's responsible for what we But what we're particularly interested in here is, is there, is there something that's proximal to all of them? Like, is there some common phenomenon that joins all of these microbes? And I'm going to show you data that suggests that that is the case. So what are the usual suspects, right? Uh, increased loss, um, reduction in the um, uh, proton motor uh, force. Um, maybe we're consuming all of that glutathione and there's a redox stress. Um, certainly there's a lot of new stuff in the literature in the last uh, couple of years, and you this later, and now this group over in uh, Germany, I think it is, group group there, showing that the uh, mitochondrial unfolded proton. Apparently, the mitochondrial unfolded protein response is the be-all and end-all. So, um, you know, in our hands, that's actually correlated. But in, actually, in our hands, we, you know, we've got a paper we're just going to get ready to submit now. Uh, it's not causative. I mean, it's certainly part of the deal, but it's not necessary. It's not sufficient. Uh, and I'm going to show you what I think is going on in these rooms. Uh, of course, you'd expect an ATP price to go up. And then, and then the other big deal that a lot of people overlook is this idea that there's an yeah. electron sink. So people tend to forget that the electron transport chain has other functions as well. Um, the, uh, in the synthesis of pyrimidines, the hydroorotate dehydrogenase, that enzyme's got to dump its electrons on the corner. They've got to get into the chain so before you can actually make those pyrimidines. So of course, um, I haven't got the data here, but we've, we've, we've got very nice data we did with uh, Sue Walter and uh, Shelley Gao showing that very clearly these pyrimidines are disrupted. So they're not getting, they're not getting, there's a DNA damage response going on this one. And by the way, I, I know that um, I said I was going to talk about the DNA damage response uh, on that flyer, but I just don't think I'm going to have time. Um, if anyone's interested, I can tell you what we've got um, on, on that. Alright, so here, here, here are our key findings. This is what I'm going to tell you about today. So I'm going to tell you that these worms excrete a unique, uh, a a unique set of metabolites. And, that, and, and those metabolites look like they've got their genesis and inhibition of, of um, the alpha ketoacid acid dehydrogenases. Um, I'm going to tell you that, I'm going to show you data that suggests that these metabolites actually inhibit a, a family of enzymes called cupins, and very specifically the alpha ketoglutarate dependent hydroxylases. They're a subset of the cupins. And, and in actual fact, it's, though, it's an inhibition of those cupins that, that you think uh, is uh, a major, playing a major role uh, in the longevity of animals. Uh, and I'm going to lead with this kind of provocative idea that, in actual fact, they're, they're very well maybe a, a sort of wiggling the cupin code. Where, where there's a direct connection between metabolites that are, that are leaking out of uh, dysfunctional mitochondria and, and, and the family of, of up to 50 different kinds of enzymes that are inhibited. And we think the phenotype that, that comes out of these cells depends on which metabolites are present, what cupins are inhibiting, and, and what cupins are present in that cell. Right, so here's our hypothesis. This is how all this started. So, our working hypothesis was that the mitochondria run on a unique metabolism. And uh, what does that mean? Well, if you think think about, uh, I used to love going to the biochemistry department when I was undergraduate, and uh, I used to love those big ball charts that had all, all those biochemical reactions. I have two of my like one of them is the much. But when I look at those guys, right, um, uh, what I see is is a is a is a network, and I see multiple ways where I can put in glucose, for example, and I can flux stuff. I could flux glucose degradation through that part, through that network in different ways. In other words, there are multiple configurations that I could use to, get, to metabolize glucose. And so what that means is um, the particular metabolic 
uh, flux pattern that I use may in of itself be conducive to, to longevity. But, and, and to think about this, you can imagine that maybe we've got different steady state levels of NADH, different steady state levels of glutathione or whatever. But that in of itself, that metabolic state in of itself is conducive to longevity. And that's kind of illustrated here. So we can't put up n, uh, like we can't put up 2,000 metabolite uh, n-dimensional space. But I've kind of illustrated it here. But if you just imagine three metabolites, and we could measure, we could take every concentration, every configuration of A, B, and C. In that in that space, there'd be a domain, there'd be a volume where life would be compatible, and then different mutants would sit. This is our prediction. Different mutants would sit in different parts of the space, right? And so if you're sitting over here, well, you're along like Mikey. If you're sitting down here, you're a Daphne. If you're up here, you're a wild type. If you're over here, you're a short wild type. How do we test that hypothesis? Is there, but before we go there, is there a precedence for this? And the answer is yes. So it turns out that there's been some really nice systems of biology work done uh, modeling in, uh, the metabolism of various single cell organisms uh, in silica. These models are, are very good now. They've got to the point where they, they're predictive. So the yeast one, for example, uh, 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 the prediction on the knockouts is about 90% accurate, which is great, right? So, so what what came out of those uh, systems of biology studies is that you test 30,000 different conditions, different concentrations of starting metabolites, different concentrations of feed stock, different cons different point mutations, sorry, different knockouts, whatever. There's only 25 pathways that domin dominate metabolism, and that's called the high flux backbone. And it turns out that most of those metabolic pathways are bimodal. They're either on or they're off. <coughs> and so when you come in and you make a mutation, it's most of the changes happen in that high flux backbone, right? Very rarely are there changes in that low, low, low flux backbone, or right? those low flux states. So, so what we did was we decided that we would uh, uh, just basically collect the exome metabolites. These are, these are metabolites that leak out of the cells as waste products. They're not defecation products, right? Um, and, and we did that because if you come in, if you ever do any kind of metabolomic studies, as soon as you try and crack worms, you're changing the system. So this was the best that we could do, but we could actually, uh, without perturbing the system, we could actually use these to fingerprint the, meta the metabolic reactions that are going on in these animals. And it's known from studies in parasitic worms, for example, that um, uh, the kinds of metabolites that they excrete are a direct fingerprint of the metabolic reactions that are going on, going on in these animals. So we kind of thought this was this was the best way to proceed. So we just uh, derivatized the metabolites, collected them in the excretome, derivatized them, put them on a mass spec, GCMS, uh, looked at the patterns that come out, identified the compounds, and then uh, see what we find. So from here on in, the rest of the study, I'm going to be talking about these mutants. Long live, neo 6 clock one ISP1, complex one, ubiquinone biosynthesis, complex three, and two short live mutants, UCI 2.3 and MEV1. MEV1 is in complex two, UCI 2.3 is in complex three. Our prediction is, if our prediction is correct, that these three long live mutants should have the same metabolic profile and the short live mutants should have the same metabolic profile. They should be different again from the wild type. That's indeed what we find. I'm running through the start right now. Here's what we've got. Here's all of the metabolites that we can detect in the exometabolite. About 200. I've got wild type up here. ISP1, long lived, short lived MEV1, and these are collected over an 18 hour period. So I'm sampling uh, every, I don't know, I think it was like 30, 1 hour, 2 hours, 6 hours, and 18 hours, something like that. Okay? And so you can see very clearly that there's a metabolic signature that's distinct to these uh, light units. And you can also see that there's a, another metabolic signature that's distinct to MEV1. When we come in and looked um, at what these metabolites were, they were enriched in all of these alpha keto acids. Alpha keto acids, all that refers to is uh, in the old uh, the old nomenclature for, for labeling um, from the keto acid from the keto group, uh, sorry, from the acid group. This was the alpha carbon, alpha relative to the C carboxyl group. So alpha keto acids and alpha hydroxy acids. You'll notice that what we pulled out were a bunch of branch chain alpha keto acids, pyruvate, alpha ketobutyrate, which is from threonine. And we also found the reduction products of many of these compounds, so hydroxycoproane. So that's what, that's, that's what stuck out here. This is kind of very interesting. It's interesting because, as you're going to see, all of these compounds are metabolized by the alpha keto acid dehydrogenases. And all of the, uh, there's three alpha keto acid dehydrogenases. Pyruvate dehydrogenase, uh, branch chain, 
alpha keto acetate autonomies and alpha keto autonomies. And they're all evolutionary related. Okay, so here's the data. ISP1, clock 1, same metabolic profile. VEV1, UCR2.3, same metabolic profile, short life. Different again as you'd expect from all time. U06, the third module, same metabolic profile. Different again from long life DAF2, long life SCLF1, long life on, uh, clock 2. Different, different classes of long life units. So there, it really does seem that these modules come in their own metabolic, uh, with their own metabolic flavor. So we've got evidence that there's something unique about these animals. What's the cause and what's the effect? Is there any effect? I mean, we know the pump's line already. The answer is yes, but let's go and have a look at it. So we tested four possibilities. Um, and I'll, I'm going to skim through these and I'm just going to get I'll focus mostly on these guys. Um, we tested whether the production of this altered metabolism was due to the aberrant activation of an anaerobic profile, metabolic profile. Um, we also tested whether there was microRNAs involved in actually re reconfiguring the metabolism. This DLD, this is a shared, this is the shared subunit of the alpha keto acid dehydrogenases. One prediction would be that since it's shared, it's the guy that's knocked out. So maybe it's being modified. Uh, and then finally, and the, and, the, and the answer appears to be this, that, that in these long live mutants, the NADH builds up in the matrix, the white kind of, And we think that there's actually reverse, reversal of electrons into these, into these <coughs> complexes. And that's what's actually leading to the, to the build-up of uh, first the keto acids and then the reduction products, the alpha acids. But here's the data. So worms are unusual in that they can survive uh, anoxia for very happily for 24 hours, um, and they're dead by about 72 hours. DAF2, the long life DAF2, the insulin mutant, uh, can survive very happily for a week. So these guys are on a complete absence of oxygen, and that's because worms have got a few little tricks up their sleeve. So our, our question was, because we've got mutants that can't run their electron transport chain, have they just turned on apparently this pathway, and that's how they're surviving. And those short life guys, they just can't turn on, so they die. So, well, the, to test that possibility, we've got to actually find out what is the anaerobic profile of a wild type worm. And so we cooked up a, um, a bunch of, uh, pros, uh, of methodologies, um, or methods at least, working with um, uh, Sue Wontrell down at the Masvac facility, and, and a very good um, technician in my lab, Jeff Butler, who's actually did most of this work. Rob Mish also did a lot of it as well. But the take-home message here is that uh, we could get, get a very nice signature for homoxic versus uh, anoxic worms. We looked at soluble compounds and we looked at these volatiles. Okay? So parasitic worms are unusual in that they... Uh, remember, remember, remember again back to biochemistry, right? When um, The only way that you can get reactions to work in a cell is if you've got electrons coming in and you've got a sink to get rid of those electrons. So you need a source and a sink, and of course you need carbon backbones. So, so the great, the great sink uh, for most of us is oxygen, but uh, worms under anaerobic conditions use what's called volatile fatty, volatile fatty acids, and actually put the electrons on those things and then blow them off. Right. So these, these are a bunch of them down here, and we, we can show very clearly that we can detect them. Okay. So, that, so what do we, what, what happens in the microbes? Um, do we see this anaerobic profile? Well, so with that data in this previous figure, previous figure here, we went back and we reconstructed the metabolism in these worms. Key, key, just quickly, key points that fell out are uh, that worms, as we'd expect under anaerobic conditions, are uh, mixed acid fermenters. And all that means, a fermentation reaction. I just, I didn't, I, I didn't, what I didn't tell you there, I said you need a source and a sink. Okay? We use oxygen. And, and another um, uh, uh, strategy that's used by organisms are uh, these fermentation reactions. And all that, all, all that fermentation reaction is, is you take a molecule that's got a, a, um, two different groups on it. One's more oxidized than another. Cut the molecule in half, and now we can transfer the electrons from this group to this group. And there's a little battery. We can actually harvest that energy. And that's all the fermentation is. It's redox balance. But in the process, we actually capture that energy. And so, so these guys ferment, and as you expect, they secrete a bunch of, of acids. And that's all that says. Judging by these compounds, the build-up of these compounds, we can tell very clearly that, that these animals are under reductive stress. So there's a build-up of NADH. Here's all the volatiles that blew off. The, the most amazing thing here is that what we found 
is that C. elegans, like many other parasitic worms, have a trick up their sleeve. They can run part of their electron transport chain backwards. That's complex two. They use complex one as normal, but they run two backwards. So it still pumps, and they still run complex five. But the fumarate reductase actually, sorry, succinate dehydrogenase runs in the reverse direction. It's a dedicated enzyme. But those electrons. Yeah, right? if we, when you talk about the reverse uh, uh, electron transport, are there protons involved? Yes, they are. No? Complex one still pumps. So you can run. So, you can run so, so when it reversed, uh, you mean the. Uh, you, uh, when the electron moves uh, in a reverse direction, the proton from the interneighboring space moves no, into the... No, sorry, in, that, into that, the that's not correct. Let me explain, I, I apologize. So worms, under anaerobic conditions, turn on, instead of using ubiquinone, they turn on production of rhodoquinone. The redox potential of rhodoquinone is such that it allows complex ones to still work in the forward direction, so it still pumps. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it's of high enough uh, redox uh, uh, potential to actually take the electrons from one, but it's of low enough redox potential so that the fumarate reductase works in the reverse direction. So in other words, the fumarate now uh, can be reduced. Okay? So it's a dedicated enzyme. But the take-home message here is that what we found is that the bottom half of, of um, the branch chain amino you know, acid degradation pathway is actually run in reverse. And, and so we blow off all of these, these volatiles. And the anaerobic profile, these keto acids are down, not up, as we see in the micro. So I can't do, they cannot run in all this. And in fact, here, here's the data. You put these micro under anaerobic conditions, and they turn on the production of all these volatiles. So they're clearly not running on They're doing something else. Okay, for the sake of time, micro let me let me jump through this. These microRNAs. So the pyruvate dehydrogenase, as most people uh, will be aware of, is controlled by a kinase and a phosphatase. So the branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase is absent in worms. And in flies and in humans, that the other tool that they use is a microRNA controlled pathway. We come in and we look at all these microRNAs, potentially controlling this part, these um, branch chain amino acid degradation. The prediction would be that the branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase is turned off. The, the, we, we looked, we've only looked at one of these guys, so we can't say definitively whether this is um, not, not happening. But we, all we can say is that uh, the, the one in green, BER124, doesn't control this pathway. It doesn't appear to be a microRNA controlling the flux through the metabolism in these worms. And don't need to worry about this. This is just basically shown. Um, we can't see upregulation of the MER124 reporter in our human strains. Um, okay, so let's, let's sort of get into, into the, uh, the meat here. As I said before, our alpha keto acid dehydrogenases, there's three of them, the branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase, pyruvate dehydrogenase, and alpha keto acid dehydrogenase. All of them are comprised of E1, E2, and E3 subunits. E3, the hydrolyphamide dehydrogenase, another name for it, is the shared subunit. It's common to all of them. The only one that's common. The prediction would be, since we see all these keto acids and all these hydroxy acids building up, yeah, you know, maybe we're actually inhibiting DLD. So let's let's test that. And in fact, not only that, maybe the prediction is if we knock out DLD using RNA bind, that we could recapitulate the mitochondrial. Maybe we could re maybe we could recover not only the metabolic profile but actually the longevity. So what's going on there? So you're going to need to understand this because I think this is this is the fundamental thing that's going on in the microbes. This is this is our best guess for how longevity happens in these animals. This is the alpha keto acid dehydrogenase structure, okay, surrounded by a ring of E1, E2, and E3s. This is the largest um, uh, soluble enzyme complex in the cell. It's also a mini electron transport chain. It just doesn't pump protons like happens in the in the microbes. Um, very briefly, the keto acid, the alpha keto acid, is oxidatively decarboxylated. All that means is we take, we take a pair of electrons and in the process we blow off CO2. They're thrown onto a thymine uh, moiety in E1. E1 is irreversible. E2, E3 are fully reversible. But the irreversibility of 1 is very important. The electrons are basically shuttled all the way around to E3, into the active site of E3. 
this is the life of AIM right here. It's reduced um, a CoA, a, a, a one carbon shortened CoA is, is thrown off and that's further, further metabolized. But this electron pair is dumped into the active site of DLD. DLD has got its own mini electron transfer chain. It's, got, it's, it's this enzyme that's got its own mini electron transfer chain. Two cysteines, a fad, and then on to NAD plus. And there's the catch, NAD, NADH. What I'm going to show you in a minute is that the electrons, what we think is going on in these movements is that the NADH pulls up to such high levels that the electrons feed back into these complexes and they get stuck here because E1 is irreversible. This, these enzymes, at least alpha-ketal glutarate dehydrogenase, uh, can make ROS on the order of mitochondrial electron transport, which is not commonly appreciated, but that's the magnitude of ROS in the scene producers. Oxygen comes in, makes a radical, and the complex is, is, is killed. Righto, so here's our prediction. We, we predict that if we knock out the LD, maybe we can recapitulate the mitochondrial including longevity. We found an antibody, uh, we found an RNAi, we made, we established an assay, had to synthesize our own, uh, our own microamide uh, moiety. Uh, so we, we can get an assay for it, we can show that we can knock it down. Here's the metabolomic states. Okay, this is, um, this is knocking down DLD with RNAi. Okay, this is the amount of DLD activity. You can see over here, our degree of knockdown, getting it down to about 15% <coughs> over here. Increase, we're sampling over time. And you can see very clearly that the more severe that we knock down DLD, we, we, as you'd expect, we see the right, the right profile appearing. This was the unexpected catch. We've never ever seen anything like this before. When you knock down DLD, increasingly uh, knock it down, certainly you get a lifespan increase. But it's nothing like it might be, but it's, <coughs> but it's significant. But you get this shortening of lifespan. This incredible shortening of lifespan at a, at a 1 in 20 dilution. So, so when we, we, we knew that we were close here. So was, we were in the vicinity, but we, didn't, we knew that we didn't quite crack it. Okay, and this is just showing that when you disrupt DLD in the right it's fully away from those complexes. The DLD is active, so it's fully active. So in other words, the inhibition can't be on DLD, it has to be somewhere else. Okay, and so this is our test. For this. We, we haven't nailed this one fully, but this is the best that we've got at the moment, showing that NADH is, is feeding backwards into these things. So we're working with you on by here. Uh, down in uh, CS, CSB, cell structure biology zone. And uh, so he, he had these uh, side bed cell lines where we take a mutant mitochondria from patients with uh, 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 Lewis syndrome. And uh, we found, lo and behold, this these same profile that we see in the mind mutants was actually apparent in these, in these human, human mutant DNA, or cells with human mutant cells with uh, mutant mitochondrial DNA from humans that were associated with short tip. So like, what the hell's going on there? What we did find but is when we treated these cells with um, an uncoupled FCCP, and uncoupled the mitochondrial membrane potential, we got rid of these keto acids, suggesting very strongly that um, it's the build up it's the build up of NADH, the potential on that the, the block being up in, in the inability to flux things through the chain is actually leading to those keto acids building up. As soon as you unplug the the, uh, the block, those, those keto acids vanish. So, okay, so if it's not DLD, and if we think it's NADH building up, um, then perhaps what's really going on is we've got to knock down all three of those branch chain keto acids all together. What I didn't tell you is DLD is a subunit of a fourth enzyme, and, and that's the um, uh, a glycine cleavage system. So we, here we are coming in with DLD, RNA, I, oh, we're knocking out all the enzymes, we shouldn't be knocking out. So we said, okay, maybe we just need to knock out these three keto acids, dehydrogenases. And that's what we've done here, we used a genetic trick. So TPK1 uh, is thiamine uh, protokinase. And that, remember I said in the E1 there, there's, there's, a, there's a thiamine moiety uh, in, in the E1 subunit. So, so when we knock out individual E1 subunits, we don't get life extension at all. However, TPK1, is uh, known, already known to be a long life mutant. It's already known. Um, and so we just simply said, okay, well, what's the, what's the metabolic profile of this TPK? Sure enough, it's actually it's the, exactly the same as a mine. This figure here, all you need to know is that um, DLD, RNAi, the neat that increases lifespan, UO6, ISP1, and CLOCK1, all of these guys have the same metabolic profile. 
and they're very distinct from the short work guys in NT. So at the moment, our working hypothesis for at least the cause of the metabolic profile in the white worms is that in the wild type worms, we would just have the shared DLD subunit, the C3 subunit, in the pyruvate and the, in, the, in the alpha kilo acid dehydrogenases. We think in the white worms that there's um, the NADH kills these enzymes, probably at the level of E1, because uh, it's irreversible. We think it's just knocking out these enzymes. And as a consequence, we get a buildup of a bunch of alpha keto acids and the, and the alpha hydroxy acid products. Okay, so that's all fine and dandy, but what does that mean? Does that mean anything at all? Is that, are they responsible for longevity phenotype? And this is where we're going for the effect. And this is kind of the big stuff that we've, the most recent work that we've got, we think most, the most intriguing stuff. Okay, so these, all these chemicals here, are the metabolites that we detected in our worms in the, in the long life of So these are in the excreta. The ones in the red are differentially abundant in, in the excretome, and they're also known to be inhibitors of these cupin enzymes. You can see that structurally, they're all very similar. They all have this alpha keto acid structure, or this alpha hydroxy acid structure. Okay? We measure the concentrations of these metabolites in our worm excretome, and they're, they're low millimole. Now why that matters is because, um, as you'll see in a minute, uh, at, that, at that level, they're known to be inhibitors of these enzymes. So here's the Cupin superfamily. The Cupin superfamily are just uh, are defined by a fold, the Cupin fold. Okay? This fold, depending on a particular subfamily of enzymes, uh, the ones that we're interested in are called the alpha ketoglutarate dependent hydroxylases. There are, and there are two sort of subarms that are evolutionarily distinct. And, and they're, dis they're distinct because all of these guys um, use uh, and, uh, sub, uh, side chains within the barrel to hold an iron and alpha ketoglutarate, which is a dedicated substrate for these enzymes, and oxygen. Okay? And so the ones that we're interested in, I'm not going to run through this. What I'm going to say is that these are all members of this family of um, alpha ketoglutarate dependent hydroxylases, the subfamily of Q. The, uh, the prolyl uh, hydroxylases, uh, HIF regulation, okay? Agl9 in worms, uh, proline hydroxylase, we take uh, uh, proteins in uh, mammalian cells, one to three. Most people will be familiar um, with the HIF system, and I'll very quickly run over it and if you're not. DNA damage repair enzymes, these ALK B enzymes, this um, enzyme that's involved in obesity, obesity is also one of these repair enzymes. The big deal, these histone demethylases, these are epigenetic enzymes, the Jumanji's. I say big deal because it's, it's never been understood why, but it's known that the mite mutants have an epigenetic component to them. So the deal about the mite mutants is that you can put them on, you can put them on RNA eyes, larvae, and then you can take them off so that their mitochondria start functioning again as adults, and yet they're still on life. So something's programmed, some, some metabolic state or some potential. DNA states program. So anyway, all of these guys essentially use alpha ketoglutarate as a dedicated substrate, in addition to oxygen, and in addition to their favourite substrate, but their prime substrate. Okay, the prime substrate in case of if, uh, uh, sorry, in case of angle nine is the backbone of it. So many of these alpha keto acids, as I was saying, um, are already known to be bona fide inhibitors of cubans. So this is great. So the obvious question is, um, well, let me back up before the obvious question comes up. For those who don't know, um, the HIF system, basically how that works under the conditions, the proline hydroxylase hydroxylates two prolines in HIF. In humans, but not in worms, there's another alpha ketoglutarate dependent hydroxylase called, called FIH, factor inhibiting HIF. That's also one of these uh, members of this family. It hydroxylates a, an asparagine, but it works on the same, uh, same biochemical reaction. Hydroxylated proline is then targeted for degradation by the VHL, uh, the von hippel lundau factor. And that goes to proteasome. Under hypoxic conditions, HIF is stabilized because it's not hydroxylated. It interacts with HIF1V in worms, that's called AHA1, and turns on an anaerobic response. Here's the big deal in worms. We knew this several years ago. We, we, um, 
hopefully we'll get this published shortly. But we got scooped on this. But um, um, this is one of those instances when um, you know the perfect storm goes against you, right? Um, but anyway, we didn't, we didn't get this out fast enough. But um, this is our own data showing very clearly that knocking down if one and AHA1, what we did here is we actually did the giant transcription factor screen. We asked what transcription factors control longevity in the monkey lives. We pulled out about 15 of those, eight I think was, were required for lifespan extension. Here's three of them. Here's AHA1, this is the beta subunit of HIF, this is HIF. You knock out HIF, you knock down the lifespan extension. This black line here, just for those people interested in lifespan studies, I did this lifespan. And, and I cannot tell you, there's about seven or eight of them here. These are all, all the same vector, just different experiments. This, this is your 0.05. It really exists, right? This is one of those lifespans. For the life of me, there was nothing wrong with this, this lifespan study. It just happens to be that these worms, um, they're average lifespan for sure. But the nice thing is it marks very clearly the 0.5%. So anything, anything down around that region has got to be there. So very clearly, my view is required if one is essential for that. <laughs> so uh, this came out in 2005. Uh, this is an old paper. This again sort of made us very intrigued by potential here. Here's our, 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 our alpha keto acids. These are uh, glioblastoma cells. Turns out that uh, just adding these things to the media is sufficient to actually stabilize if one. So we repeated this experiment uh, in worms, in 3 to 3 on fibroblasts and in and in vitro. Here's, here's, here's our results. Here's all the metabolites that we checked. Okay? These are our, these are basically all of our out here and these guys here are branched chain keto acids, there's some hydroxy acids in there, and there's a few controls. When you add these metabolites to worms and ask do you activate a transgenic HIF1 report, the answer is yes. But not not really good for these branched chain keto acids. It's kind of a little bit of a um, disappointment. Until we moved over to our three to three other worms. <coughs> And we know that, we think what's going on here now, I'm not going to show you the data, we think, uh, we know that these metabolites are starting to get into worms, but we know that there's a, there's a bunch of stuff going on in terms of, uh, they're cross-reacting with the transporters, their importers. But I don't need to go into that, all I need to tell you is that these keto acids very clearly activate a HIF-1 uh, reporter in 3 d 3 one uh, fibroblasts, mouse fibroblasts. Not only does it act, not only does it stabilize HIF-1, but it actually activates, this is actually a when we come in silica, this is our Jumanji. So this is a purified protein acid. And again, we can see very clearly that several of these compounds inhibit um, Jumanji activity. Um, this happened to be the human protein that we were working with. Uh, this is a, uh, a model showing that, um, this is a homology model showing that the active site of the worm protein uh, is almost is identical, essentially, to the worm protein, a superhuman protein. So, so it's very likely, and I'd say highly unlikely, that um, these compounds don't also inhibit the Jumanji of worms. Okay, so the catch: what if you add these? What if you add these metabolites to worms? Is that in of itself sufficient to increase lifespan? And the answer is yes. It took us a long time to figure out what was going on here. These metabolites aren't stable. The bacteria metabolize them, as you might expect. Uh, and the worms don't grow in dead bacteria. But it took us a long time to prove that, and we showed that nicely with animal I'm going to show you the data. But what we did find in the course of all these experiments is that one of the compounds, that one compound that was stable in back to the bacteria, the metabolism by bacteria was this 24 PDA, this compound up here. Um, when we add this compound back to worms, we can get a lifespan extension. It's not much, about 15%, but it's significant and it's highly reproducible. Moreover, we can find it in a cat four mutant strain that has a, a, an enhanced cuticle permeability. And if we do it in a HIF-1 back where we're not going to HIF-1, we lose the longevity effect. We don't, and, and in this HIF-1 background, we also see that it's actually, if you add the 2 4 it results in uh, uh, larval lethal phenotype. Okay, so here's my last two slides. So here's what we think is going on for the mite units and our longevity. So what we predict is going on is that these electron transport chain mutants lead to a buildup of NADH. The NADH uh, feeds backwards into these alpha keto acid dehydrogenases and blocks these three complexes. These leak out of the mitochondria, the alpha keto acid substrates for these enzymes, build up to high, high mounds. Um, the hydroxy acids are formed by a reduction, and we think 
uh, based on literature, these are probably carried out by, by lactate dehydrogenase and like enzymes. That's all that they are. Okay? So these leak out of cells. We think these then leak out of cells and, uh, and affect the whole animal. These are actually acting kind of like a mitochondria. Because remember, we find these things outside of the cell. Right? So that's our working hypothesis. And we also think that they um, inhibit HIF, and we found that in these Jumungias. And, um, and this is just illustrated over here what I was saying here. NADH fitting backwards into the, into the complex. E10 reverse forms, so at least to disruption these complexes. So here's our Cupin code right here. Okay? This is kind of, this is why we think uh, this has uh, got relevance to a lot of, potentially a lot of uh, mitochondrial related disorders. So, so the question is this. I just showed you before that we saw these compounds building up in, in uh, the cyber, the human cyber lines, same kind of compounds, and yet, and yet in worms they result result result, result in increased lifespan, but in, in humans we know that that's a uh, detrimental effect. So what's going on there? Are we? Are, well, one possibility might be this: that um, there are several different keto acids that are presumably made. Um, we we propose that. Um, some of these things are probably acting as rogue substrates, not just inhibitors, but rogue substrates. And there's a precedence for that, but there's 2 hydroxyluride this onco metabolite, uh, inhibition of um, isocitrate dehydrogenase. Uh, uh, a mutant form of ICD dehydrogenase actually makes a new, pro a new, a new molecule, 2 hydroxyluride, which is one of these guys. This is the hydroxy acid of alpha Um And it's known to be both an inhibitor and an activator. So what we think is going on is that, depending on the cupins that are present in the cell, depending on the alpha keto acids that accumulate, we get some kind of net effect, phenotype 1, phenotype 2. And, and so that's what we're trying to prove at the moment. Um, so that, that's, where, that's, that's where we're at. Um, and so just let me thank, uh, of course, well, here's our key findings, just briefly. Um, you've seen these already. Um, and of course, just let me thank the people uh, in, in blue, most of the people here, helped in one way or the other. So with that note, um, uh, thanks for your time and um, take questions. Well, I got two questions. So uh, let's say education is what's left after you forgot everything you learned in organic chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> and so I've got two questions. One is, uh, uh, have you looked at the Dowers? Do the Dowers have anything going on that looks like this? Uh, we have. Uh, actually, we have looked at Dowers. Um, not not Dowers, per se. We've looked at the Dactinians. We don't see these in the Dactinians. So that's I just wonder if uh, and the Dowers are going to be long-lived, because, I mean, it's a, a long-lived variant. And I, I wonder if the stress of anoxia isn't trying to get them to, to do whatever trick they do in development when they go into the Dowers. Yeah, that was quite possibly. And then the other question is, um, uh, you, you talk about the excretome. You're measuring all these things in the excretome. Yeah. It, is that really into the environment? It's outside the worms. How do you measure that? Well, yeah, I agree. Yeah, but, okay. but right. with mass spectroscopy. Yeah. But but basically, uh, so a population of worms is putting this stuff out. Yeah. Have you ever taken that epulent, that excretum, and put it into worm, a, a colony of worms that is not suffering anoxia, and see if it can it signal we have, to yes. another population? Yeah, we have done that. Um, so what happens? Uh, it depends on the strain. So it's 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 messy. Yeah. It's messy. That's all, that's all I can say. Uh, as you might expect in a, in a complex mix. Mm -hmm. So don't forget what's going on there, right? So I think Don's point out a good point here. Um, we're, we've got a, we've got 100, 120,000 worms in a dish, and we're collecting their metabolites, right? So we've got no idea which cells are making this. We've got no idea where these metabolites are processed before they even get outside of the worm. Um, our best guess at the moment, based on what we know from the genetics, is that it's neuronal. That that the, uh, the, the primary phenotype is a neuronal phenotype, and these metabolites are probably leaking out of out of the neurons. So remember, worms have 300 neurons, a thousand, about roughly a thousand cells, 959 something like that, and, and, and 300 of those, uh, so a third of those are, are neurons. Um, that's our best. That's our. That's, that's what the data is pointing toward at the moment. Um, so what I did talk about is we know that not all cells are going to have 
the metabolite transporters to take up these ketoacids. Right? But that's interesting as well, because it means that they also can't get out. So we don't know how, how, much this, how, how high these concentrations really build up to in some of these cells. They could be massively high. We just don't know. Uh, and they're hard experiments to do. Right? We're, we're trying, what we've been doing at the moment, we've been trying to establish a cell culture model where um, we're close, we're at the limits of our sensitivity with the mass spec here. But what, we're, what we've been trying to do is actually purify out different subtypes, cell types in the worms, and then see if we can actually see which ones of these might be making a specific profile. Um, easier said than done. I think we, we're, we're close. Um, I'll know in a couple of weeks if we've got it. Uh, do you think uh, any of those uh, metabol metabolic uh, acid you accumulate, you found here, has it anything to do with uh, their mitonuclear <coughs> protein imbalance theory recently? Yeah. Uh, in nature? Okay, so the nature paper you were referring to is this mitochondrial on protein response. So this idea that, that um, Sending proteins to the mitochondria to get imported. If the mitochondria can't handle all those proteins, we start getting proteins being up left unfolded in the matrix. That turns on a UPR, an unfolded protein response, in the matrix from the, that emanates from the mitochondria, goes back to the nucleus, and dampens cytoplasmic translation. And so we get a match. And so, so the thinking is that there's an imbalance, and this is what's this is the idea of, of uh, this UPR controlling the longevity response in the um, Do I think our metabolites are affecting that process? Um, I can't see a direct connection. Uh, but that's not to say that process is not going on. Uh, I just don't think it's the, the entire story. Okay? Um, that's all I can say on that at the moment. Yeah, yeah because they have uh, showed that uh, several Antibiotics can prolong life in the world. Yeah, but you can you make an argument that all of those are also increasing NADH, right? And all of those are actually leading to the production of these ketoacids. So that's the problem with that. And that's why we've come out. That's why the experiment that we did. I don't have up here. The experiment we did is we come in and we overexpress ATS1. So the way this works is if, um, in worms. I don't uh, humans don't have this, but. Um, it looks like what's going on is ATFS1, is this transcription factor that normally is taken into the matrix of the mitochondria and degraded. But as soon as that membrane potential drops, it actually has got a nuclear localization signal that goes to the, to the nucleus and turns on the UPR. Okay. So, that's, so what we've shown is that when we constitutively turn on that ATFS1, that nuclear transcription factor, send it to the nucleus, and turn on the UPR, we don't get light extension. So it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. It might be necessary, but it's not sufficient. Any more questions? Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if you have not signed in, make sure you do so and you'll be receiving an evaluation uh, later on today to evaluate today's presentation. Have you signed in? I got you signed in, sir. Uh, yeah, I guess science.